Happy Monday, Matt. Happy Monday. How's it going? Good. Good. Just enjoying the uh, snowy day we have here in Salt Lake. It's kind of nice. We're finally actually. back to winter. Yeah, we it's kind of our to winter. second winter. Well, we had a we got a start of winter in October. And now we're back at it. So mm -hmm. definitely, but we're the land of the greatest snow on earth. So it's, just, it's nice yes. looking out the window and seeing white. So. Yeah, I don't know what the plans are for the ski resorts right now, but uh, hopefully we have a good ski season in spite of everything else. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should be interesting. Uh, and then the backcountry skiing, I think it's going to, uh, hopefully it, it, hopefully people are safe out there. I have a suspicion it's going to kind of mimic what we saw with hiking. Uh, climbing, yeah. Just mm -hmm. lots of Everybody out. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. But yeah, backcountry skiing is, uh, for all you people out there, pay attention, it's dangerous. So know what you're doing, <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, cool. So this week we want to talk about uh, modern data pipelines. I think we just want to kind of give people an overview of uh, what a modern data pipeline um, is and isn't. So do you want to yeah. kick it, it off? Really, what are your thoughts? Yep. And it really is going to be an overview because it's a vast topic. I think that's the point we realized that it's just this enormous topic, with numerous tools. Right. Yeah. As we started uh, making the uh, show notes for this, I think we realized that, geez, this is like a whole class, um, which I think, uh, you know, we, we might be teaching at some point soon. But uh, yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of material here. A lot. So, yeah. I mean, if, if you think about modern data engineering, in some sense, it's entire profession, right? Like, uh, I, I think both of us think of data engineering being more about pipelines than about databases these days. It used to be about installing updates and managing schemas and stuff is still somewhat important you still have to manage the schemas but like it's all about the transformation what you do with the data mm -hmm. yep yeah, let's dive right in yeah yeah so like what, what are some components of a modern data pipeline yeah that's i mean we in another discussion we talked about uh, elt versus etl and i think a modern data pipeline is going to encompass both of those so yeah, can you elaborate on that? What is what? What do you mean by that? So so ELT means extract, load, transform, mm -hmm. and that's kind of a more modern paradigm. Traditionally, we talked about ETL, so extract, transform, load, and so ETL would work like this: you typically pull data out of a database. You'd have some kind of heavy-duty transform tool that would do some basic processing, and then you'd write it back out to your data warehouse. Um, as data warehouses have gotten more powerful, and especially with the emergence of cloud data warehouses gotten more into ELT, where all the transformation can actually happen in the database itself. You can basically transfer data almost directly from your operational store into your data warehouse and then do all your transformations there. But I think in practice, most, most companies are going to end up using both paradigms for various types of data processing. Right. Yeah, I think there's some, there's some other characteristics too. Um, uh, you know, the, the, you sh you should be able to move uh, your data from your source to your um, destination in a predictable fashion, right? So I would say like old school data pipelines had the characteristics that um, they were very monolithic. So you could keep adding on to these pipelines, but eventually, uh, as we've seen all over the place, uh, these sort of older paradigms, they tend to build on themselves to the point where it's very creaky and jobs um, have a lot of dependencies and they take a very long time. And if anything breaks, you have to restart the entire job and the whole process over. So we, we've seen companies where data pipelines take, you know, 36, 48 plus hours to run. And if anything in that pipeline uh, breaks, you have to restart the entire thing. Um, yeah. And so that's potentially two plus days of not getting any value from your data. And the business is obviously waiting for the reports. Um, and uh, it's just impossible for uh, people to make decisions. So I'd say that that's like, was the pattern for data pipelines for a very long time. Now it's very much an anti-pattern. Uh, yeah. 36 hour data pipelines are a big no-no. If you have them, please, please, please consider uh, streamlining your approaches. It doesn't need to be this way and your stakeholders will thank you for this. Yeah, and I, I think fundamentally, and we always talk about how it's not about technology, but technology does play a role, right? And 
Uh, that's kind of why we emphasize the cloud because all of these tools become much more scalable in the cloud. So for example, if you're on Snowflake, you can run separate data warehouses for your analytics in your ETL or ELT. And that way you don't have those bottlenecks. You can process much faster. You just scale up as much compute as you need to run those pipelines in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that brings, but the, yeah, so scalability, reliability, um, being able to um, spin up, spin down, uh, these are all attributes, let's say, of um, modern data uh, pipelines and, you know, subsequently modern data processing technologies as well. But it's sort of a separate notion, but, you know, the, the ability to move data from point A to, to B or point A to B then Z and so forth, like that's, um, you know, you're seeing definitely more DevOps approaches uh, to how that works. Um, so, yeah, you've got monitoring, you've got retry going up back to your point about having to rerun the full data pipeline. The expectation now is that each of these stages is monitored, and if one stage fails, then you get an alert, and then hopefully you can debug the problem in that one stage. Or maybe it's just a transient problem, and you re rerun that one part, even if you have to scale up a new server to do it. And that allows you to deliver data also with a fairly high um, service level availability, so. Right, yeah, so, I mean, yeah, I think another attribute of the um, modern data pipeline is consistency, yeah. right? So, um, and if it's not consistent in the sense where, uh, you know, I guess it sort of falls in line with the predictability aspect, but it, it is somewhat different as well. Um, but, you know, consistency produces trust. Uh, within your own data team and also across the organization. When people can trust that, uh, you know, their um, reports are gonna be ready, when you say they're gonna be ready, or when your models are gonna be ready, um, and in production when they're supposed to be ready, that it, it's it's really hard to place a price on, on that amount of trust. And it's in, it's incredibly easy to, to lose trust as, you know, if, you're, if you're not paying attention, so. Yeah. I, th I think there's another aspect to this which comes up in DevOps a lot too, and that is that companies who are really successful in DevOps argue that their teams are happier because if DevOps is done right, the on-call people get called in a lot less, right? Mm -hmm. They're not under tremendous stress. They rarely have to come in because the system is set up to be very resilient. And it's the same thing with data pipelines. Like I, I know many companies that have overnight on-call people to make sure that that data gets there. And they end up having to do stuff most nights, like they're up all night if they're on-call. And if you can adopt these more modern approaches, more modern tools, more modern alerting and retry, then they're going to get called in a lot less. The mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely focus on like uh, you know limiting the blast radius of, of the if something happens in your pipeline. So. You know, I mean, if you, if you think of it like an oil pipeline, like, you know, it'd, it'd be unimaginable that an uh, oil pipeline sorting in uh, Alaska going all the way to Mexico, for example, like if one piece of that breaks, the entire pipeline is therefore ruined. Like that is silly, but that, that sadly is what, um, you know, many companies still have to contend with, with these more kind of legacy uh, data pipeline systems. So. Right. right. And it's, it's been a struggle to modernize in some cases. I think yep. The problem is that it's, it's easier to probably build greenfield and then transfer over individual components than to try to evolve your current stack. It can be a real struggle to do it that way. It most certainly is. It, it, the one we come across a lot or um, where companies have a lot of SSIS jobs. Right. Right. This, this, is, this is something we see over and over again. And um, SSIS jobs are, are, are great. Uh, I think the issue becomes when uh, you know, years and years and years of um, SSAS code uh, keeps building and building upon itself. And it becomes this very brittle monolithic code base um, where every other piece is dependent upon every other piece in this code base. And it, it becomes very difficult to reason about the pipeline, to reason about uh, its workflow. And as a consequence, when it comes time to rethink your general data architecture and perhaps migrating it to the cloud, um, this is perhaps the, the hardest part you have to contend with are these, uh, these legacy SSIS workflows. Um, if it's too gnarly uh, and nobody understands it, you, you could, I guess in Azure, just port it over. Um, you know, I mean, they, they do allow you to port the SSIS jobs in with I think data factory, but um, but, you know, I, I could make another argument that um, 
you know, you're basically just, you, you haven't really solved your, your underlying problem in the sense that you can't reason about your code base. You just moved your problem into the cloud, yeah. which would arguably cost you more money actually. Um, because, you know, cloud, if, if you're treating the cloud, like you, like you do your on-premise system, that that's, um, probably not a very cost effective way of doing stuff. So. Yeah, and a lot of your cost is in the fact that, to your point, it gets to the point where these jobs um, can't even be understood by the team anymore. The person who wrote various components is probably gone, and so someone else is just trying to keep the job going. And you get the you accrue this huge cost or interest on tech debt, as one of our friends put it on Friday, because you can't fix data quality issues and you can't evolve to new data needs. And so both of those things are really gonna harm your business over time. And so then it becomes a question of, okay, what can I deprecate? What can I rip out? What can I start over? Because this old data pipeline that like gets nominally running, but if it can't evolve and I can't fix problems with it, then it's actually costing my company a huge amount of money. Right, yeah, can you imagine migrating to the cloud and taking your, um, your SSS job that takes 48 plus hours to run and then moving that into the cloud? <laughs> like you have, you've not solved a single problem. In fact, you made your problems like exponentially worse, I, I could argue. Um, so I think our, our advice is, well, try not to get into the situation at yeah. all where you have the 48 hour pipeline. But if you happen to have that, we understand it's tough. Right. And I, I can't, I, you know, I would, I would, I would definitely empathize with you in that. I, I don't know anyone who would say, well, I really like having this like very large delay and um, you know, possibility of like lots of broken things along the way in my pipeline like nobody's gonna come out and say that that's a, an absolute lunacy um but maybe take the time to you know dissect the processes that you want to keep um that might be fundamental to your new pipeline and your new way of doing stuff in your new data infrastructure deprecate old stuff but again it, it's incredibly difficult to reason about in, in these um these sort of rats nested code bases so yeah, yeah, it becomes, becomes a huge nightmare at some point. I, I think that's why both of us probably predict that in, in the near future, as companies are transitioning to cloud, we'll see hybrid for quite a while. And it's not that cloud can't support the hardware that they need. Cloud can do that just fine. But it's like, does it really make sense to just lift and shift this stuff that's really brittle and not working very well in the first place? Or should you just kind of leave some of it running and then transfer piece by piece and rebuild and then gradually burn down the old stuff over several years? Mm -hmm. and the paradigm that we've seen work somewhat better. Right. Yeah, it's not going to be an overnight lift. I mean, if you needed an overnight lift, there are certainly tools that can, I think, kind of at least give you a fresh start. Yeah. Um, and we'll get into those in a bit. But, uh, you know, unraveling your business logic and placing that from your, say, on-prem into the cloud, uh, it's um, that... It's, there's just a lot of debt involved in that. There's no way around it. And it, it took you a long time to get here. And it's probably going to take you a long time to get out of it. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. The kind of lifting shift you're talking about is analogous to like a, a hoarder who moves to another house and they move every single thing <laughs> in their house, like everything in the closets in the garage without cleaning up anything. And then they just like grab all of it, throw it in a truck and move it to the new place. And I, it's not that businesses intend to hoard or accumulate a lot of tech debt and crap, but it just happens over time. And so there comes a time when you want to rethink that and rethink your paradigms. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, definitely. I, I, yeah, I couldn't have said it better. That's great. Um, you know, so we, we talked about some, uh, let's talk about, let's switch gears maybe a second and talk about paradigms. So, um, what are some of the major paradigms of, of a data pipeline? I think the one I encounter the most is orchestration. And orchestration means that your tool is designed to really control other processes. And this is becoming more and more important in the cloud, back to what you were saying, because in the cloud, data infrastructure isn't going to live in like a single system. It's not just going to live in like an Oracle or a Teradata or a SQL Server. Typically, it will live across many different systems. And so you need kind of a central control hub that handles a lot of the DevOps and management and alerting aspects of the pipeline and make sure that each piece executes. And also a good orchestration system has retry capabilities so that a pipeline failure doesn't require a restart of the entire pipeline, which is what tends to happen if you just script things out and do things synchronously one at a time. An orchestration system can save you a lot of pain in that mm -hmm. respect. And so popular orchestration systems right now, I mean, there are actually a lot of these, uh, but like Matillion is one that we work with a lot, Airflow we work with quite a bit. Yeah. 
I would say for people who, who don't know, um, you know, so Matillion is more of a graphical, uh, graphically based yeah. tool. I would say um, it, it definitely uh, is a very modern uh, cloud data pipeline, data transformation tool. If, you, if your team is uh, coming from an Informatica or Talon background, I would say they'd probably be at home with Matillion because it's just drag and drop and you can, uh, you can very visually understand your pipeline. Um, and that's got all the typical components. Stuff like Airflow is uh, it's code based, right? So it's Python, um, as are a lot of data tools these days. And so, and, and then there's other tools uh, as well with DBT for transformations and so forth. And so there is, it's interesting because now there's two schools of thought really, you know, in the, in the old days, it was very, uh, very much, um, you know, predominantly graphically, uh, uh, like kind of GUI based uh, data pipeline tools, you know, your Informatica, your talents and so forth, right? And, and now it's definitely switching more towards, uh, you know, sort of the role of like an analytics engineer, right? Where engineer implies that there's more, um, you know, kind of pipelines as code, transformations as code. And, and so it's, we're not gonna say one, one way is better than the other. I, I think what's most effective is that you're able to have robust pipelines that you can understand reason about and that through their job at the end of the day and produce consistent results. So. Exactly. I mean, I would say if, if we're just talking Matillion versus Airflow, and again, those are just two of many options, but Airflow is very, very powerful because I can write any Python code I want to, but it requires your team has to develop a lot of technical expertise to use it. Well, there are a lot of gotchas behind the scenes and a lot of engineering details that you have to understand. And so that's the trade off, like how much general flexibility and power do I want versus how much technical know how do I, I want my team to have and how much time do I want them to have to invest in engineering and managing a complex tool. So mm -hmm. I think you see that discussion over and over again with data pipelining tools, right? With modern pipeline tools, there's a lot of opportunity to write custom code, but there's a lot of engineering required to, to fully utilize that. And so sometimes a graphical tool is a much better way to go and depending on team capabilities and priorities. Yeah. And then, you know, it, to, to also switch some gears again, there's, yeah. there's paradigms of, uh, you know, batch and streaming, right? Yep. So, um, and another way to think about this is, you know, bounded should be more of your batch paradigm versus unbounded data. And, and I think, for me, it makes more sense to think of things in terms of time bounds for data yeah. and maybe, you know, um, taking those bounds off and then you just basically have a stream. I think it's easier to reason about that, but uh, the buzzwords being what they are, it's most people think, you know, batch and streaming. So we'll just, you know, streaming is another word for real time, right. uh, which is another buzzword, um, you know, and which has its own caveats. My favorite question is, well, what, what, do you, what exactly does real time mean to you? Um, exactly. Yeah, it's a continuum, right? In reality. Right. I mean, because, uh, you know, this, this is probably a discussion for another day, and I'm sure we'll make a video on, um, yeah. you know, the nuances of, of streaming in particular. But but it is interesting when you, when you think about data sets, because it's the batch paradigm. You're basically just artificially, um, you know, putting time windows around your data. Yeah. So, I mean, most, a lot of companies, you know, they'll, they'll just run their uh, data at midnight, for example, every day. And that represents that fixed unit of time. I guess the problem is what if you have late arriving data? Which is, yeah, especially where companies control less of their own data, meaning they're all using, you know, 20, probably 20 different SaaS platforms or more. Late arriving data is a huge problem. <laughs> so, Big time. I, mean, I know I was reading some marketing stats the other day on uh, how you know, marketing uh, agencies use data. And I think the, the average marketing company as of 2019 was using 18 data sources. Yeah. So uh, unless you're really familiar with the quirks of all those, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be a fun exercise trying to line everything up by time. So, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, time so, zones and everything else. Oh yeah. Yeah. Time zones are a huge source of pain for software development and data. Mm -hmm. And then when you get into streaming too, you know, it, some, you know, some of our partners, they, they deal in what I would call, you know, the, in the truest sense, real time Druid, for example, is great for queries where you need to analyze data, like literally as it happens, um, exactly. which is a fundamentally different problem than what, you know, your traditional data warehouse is, is uh, you know, going to address. So. Yeah.
And I would say, I mean, I'll just bring this up right now across all of these paradigms, batch versus streaming, real time, how real time is it? Don't get caught up in buzzwords, um, figure out where mm -hmm. your value actually is and don't just say, oh, we need everything real time right away. Real time is really nice to have. It also tends to be expensive and consume more CPU than a batch system to do the same job. Um, and so where's my business value? Is getting data like five minutes after it happens? Is that going to do a lot for your business? Or maybe you only need it an hour after it happens? Or maybe you really, really need sub-second queries and figure out what the use yeah. case is and then choose a tool appropriately. And that kind of brings us to the complexity of the data pipelines too. I mean, we see a lot of different uh, paradigms. Um, you know, it, it's sort of this continuum of like uh, no code, kind of low effort. Uh, right. all the way to, um, you know, uh, fully coded, um, you know, large effort uh, things. So, I mean, on the, on the no code side, I would say you have things like your five trans, your stitch, um, companies that just are data pipelines as a service. On the other hand, if you wanted to set up a data pipeline in your own, I mean, you know, it's like, you, know, you have Kafka, which is awesome. Um, and then you can kind of go for managed services in between. So, yeah. And then, of course, there's the question of the code that you write in the pipeline itself, even if you use like astronomer.io or Cloud Composer for Airflow, you still have to write the underlying code. Mm -hmm. Or you can use like a managed Spark service like Databricks, for example. Um, it's all about identifying where the business value is, like where should your yeah. team be spending their time fundamentally. I, I think that's a discussion, that's something that gets lost in all these technology discussions. Your biggest, most important, probably most expensive resource is your team. And so figure out what they should be doing with that time and what's actually going to serve the business. Fully. Yeah, because every every vendor, and we work with a lot of vendors, and I think we're going to say pretty neutral in this statement, but every vendor is claiming that their solution is the silver bullet right. to um, your data pipeline needs and that uh, only if you purchase their particular solution, uh, you know, will, will all of your problems be solved and you'll be future proofed. Um, as you as you pointed out, understand what you what you're trying to do. Understand your needs. Um, there isn't a one size fits all solution out there. I would say anyone who's trying to claim that they have a one size fits all solution is um, being a bit disingenuous, and you should. Um, maybe look at other options if, if somebody is adamantly claiming this. Yeah, and again, watch out for buzzwords. One of my least favorite, one of the buzzwords I hate the most is no code, actually, because mm -hmm. I have yet to see a no code tool. Um, I love Matillion, but like there are lots of cases where you need to write some code in Matillion. I, I also really hate it when database vendors claim that SQL is no code. <laughs> I've seen that many, many times. Right, that's <laughs> rubbish. <laughs> you, if it's no code, then you're writing really bad SQL, basically, is what it comes down to. <laughs> Oh, you're not writing it at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you're just adding you know, together that barely works. Yeah, yeah. And it, it, so there's, there's a lot of good products out there, um, but definitely do your due diligence, uh, you know, and, 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 and balance the claims against, again, what your needs are. Yeah. Um, it's like, I think we've hit on that uh, countless times, not just in this talk, but in others. But it's, it's something, because it, it's really easy to get enamored with, um, you know, sort of the latest, greatest buzzwords, especially real time right now. Real time has got a lot of hype. Um, I think the question that I ask people, you know, if you had a real time uh, data pipeline and uh, insights, like what action are you going to take um, with that data, right? Now that you can get insights up to the millisecond, what action will you take that's markedly different than what you would take otherwise? Exactly, yeah. Because there's also this phenomenon that I've heard some people call chasing your tail, which is where you keep looking at reports and with real time, there are more reports to look at because effectively you can have a new report every second. Mm -hmm. And the reports just waste your time. Like they're not, <laughs> they're just a shiny thing to look at that doesn't help your business at all. And so just having like excessive data in some sense that's not useful or excessive reports doesn't really serve you well. Not at all. I mean, the litmus test I always use is if, if, it's, if, if it's a real time, action that you need to take yeah. that should be an automation that's right. not a report right so you like, you getting just five seconds worth more data in a graph for example right it, it's completely meaningless and it's not going to drive any any better decision than you would have had five seconds ago 
that really needs to be an automated task actually where you just like remove the human from the decision making equation in general because um, if you're if you're responding to something that quickly either you have this insane dopamine rush from just data coming in and being deluged by it or um you can't process that amount of data mentally in order to make a good decision. It's probably a decision that needs to be um, written in code and uh, automated either heuristically or using ML. Yeah, so. exactly right. Yeah, so that's, I mean, I would probably go beyond that and say that if you have a real-time use case, then there's almost certainly automation um, piece mm -hmm. to it, right? Because humans can't really respond <laughs> in real time. So there, there's not necessarily a lot of value to a real-time type product unless there's some automation attached to it. Right. And, and this does, I think, reflect, it's starting to be reflected in some, you know, I would say, I, I, would, I wouldn't say newer because they aren't new, but, um, you know, I would say more um, forward thinking software engineering uh, patterns like CQ, CQRS is one that comes to mind. Mm -hmm. um, so that basically just removes the need for a database at all. And you're just dealing with events as they happen in the application. Right. Um, I mean, in my opinion, if you can, if you don't need to store the data and you can just, uh, you know, put data into streams and subscribe to those streams, that's also awesome. Um, but, you know, it's, it's just, a, it's a different paradigm. And I think you, you really got to make sure that that, um, you know, sort of event driven architecture really supports what you're trying to do. It may be extremely useful and it may make sense. It may also just be like way too complex for where you are right now. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, to be perfectly frank, if you're like a flower shop or a chain of flower shops, I, I don't know, right. maybe, maybe you have a use for real time, probably not, uh, maybe for inventory or something like this. Um, if you're an online retailer, then typically re real time becomes important for it, certain, at least for certain parts of your data. And maybe just focus on those. I, I mean, I think that's another mistake I've seen where people try to boil the ocean with real time. And my opinion is that there's almost always a substantial place for batch and just focus on real time for the stuff that has high value. Because well, I would say like, yeah. you know, so like to compare like 1-800-Flowers against like your sister's flower shop, for example, yeah, yeah, your exactly. sister probably doesn't need like real time, real time <laughs> but I would argue that 1-800-Flowers definitely yeah, needs might. That's that because yeah. they're just at a different scale, like their e-commerce operation and their phone operations. It's a, it's a different, it's a different business. And right? it's mass logistics. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. order and they have to be planning for the next. Right, like if you're, if you're, if you're uh, running uh, technology for Uber or something, like, yeah, oh, you want, everything needs to be event-driven. You don't, you don't get the luxury of like waiting for batch. Like you have to have it event-driven. There's no other way. But again, this is all, it, what we see, I think, is, is companies um, wanting to, you know, we're talking at existing companies, maybe trying to digitally transform, yeah. um, but putting the cart before the horse, like, it, you know, um, it's this is a progression you're not just going to jump into doing you know your entire business is just going to be like event driven real time as cool as that sounds like in a year um especially if you have these like if you're coming from where you have a 48 hour ssis job hellscape to um you know this this utopian vision of uh real time uh everything is streaming kafka you know um automation i mean that's that's a that's a journey um, cause yeah. over here is all your business logic that you have to somehow unwind unless somehow it doesn't matter anymore and you just want to reinvent everything. Then in that case, go for it. Um, so even then it's going to take a long time to build everything out. Right. And so fundamentally identify what's valuable to you and focus on that. Say, Oh, for this particular, for my inventory system, I can make orders and get things delivered very quickly. Therefore maybe that should become real time. And then I can issue new orders within a few minutes of some event happening of customers purchasing a lot of a particular product, for example. Right. Deliver the value guess, there and look for the next use case. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's right. So, you know, to kind of cap it off, like what, I guess, where do you think the, um, you know, what, what's the future of data pipelines maybe for the next five years, if you were to take a guess? Um, let's see. I think the orchestration tools are going to continue getting better and they'll actually become much more important as the cloud continues to grow. Um, companies will have more data sources, more systems running. I think on the real-time side, real-time uh, systems will get simpler and more accessible. On the batch side, there's a trend that we've been seeing since the introduction of Hadoop, which is that 
Uh, batch has shifted away from medium data. So medium data is what I would call the traditional data warehouse. Maybe you're storing up to a petabyte or something like that. And batch is going to shift toward many, many hundreds of petabytes. So in other words, batch systems will be able to handle just massive data. And so that will be part of the decision between batch and real time. Your batch systems will focus more on uh, backward looking analytics across just enormous data sets. They'll continue to gain new machine learning capabilities that are more batch oriented, like training neural nets. And again, the real time systems will get more accessible and we'll continue to see more integration between the two. It's fairly seamless where you really don't have to think about how to integrate batch in real time. You just decide what to put into what system and then you have a system that brings those two sources together. Right. I mean, Beam was, a, uh, I think, an early adopter or basically kind of invented that paradigm, actually. So, um, yeah, it'd be good to see uh, something like that more in use. Um, I mean, I think, too, there's there's sort of this, uh, this, this other piece, really. I mean, the, the analytics uh, data pipelines get a lot of attention right now. I think there's also the um, machine learning data pipelines uh, that sort of get lumped in, but I think they're different in a lot of ways because you're dealing with um, data that needs to be read by machine learning algorithms. This isn't the same data that's read by human eyes. And, you know, so um, I think there's going to be definitely a, you know, a lot more attention on that space as well. You know, uh, you know, streaming is, is going to continue growing in popularity. But when you look at the number of companies out there that are still Dark matter companies, as we're fond yeah. of saying, right? These yeah. are the companies that comprise most of the known business universe. They are um, running on-prem Windows installations. They're not in the cloud. They're not doing anything fancy. They're highly profitable. And this is this is a lot of companies out there. Cloud cloud adoption is still super early, um, and we're still in the very, um, I think, nascent stages of of what will eventually be a very large uh, push into the cloud. But these companies still have to reconcile their existing on-prem data infrastructure and move that into the cloud. And I think in the next five years, that's more of what is going to be happening, but it, it's, it's happening while there's all these startups in the ecosystem that are like chipping away at these companies bottom line. And so it's going to be an interesting um, Darwin moment in a lot of ways where these like legacy companies are trying to modernize while, um, you know, just more and more and more and more startups that are cloud and data and digital native are out there just doing all the stuff that, you know, from day one that these, um, you know, incumbents are, are doing and so, or, or want to do, right, which is uh, become competitive in a, you know, in a digital, uh, you know, format. So that, that, to me, that's going to be a fascinating uh, competitive landscape to watch too, which is what happens to these legacy companies as they try and move into the cloud and, and um, will they survive? Yeah, and it's interesting too, because uh... You bring this up and this coincides with a big shift that we've seen with the cloud vendors. Uh, I think Azure itself has probably always been very enterprise focused, but AWS built their business around startups. That was really their focus for a long time. The assumption being, hey, find a few unicorns and then those are going to grow into your you know, billion dollar customers in the future. And probably at least six, seven years ago, AWS started shifting toward the enterprise, which is exactly what these companies are. They're more traditional companies. Um, a little more, a little more conservative IT departments, but they begin to realize the opportunity of the cloud. And then we've seen that at Google as well. You know, Google used to be heavily focused on some core products like uh, App Engine that were very focused on startups, and now they're making a big enterprise push. And so I'll be really curious to see how that sales effort goes in terms of getting more traditional companies to move to the cloud quickly within the next couple of years, with less yeah. focus on startups. But the startups remain very agile and are going to give many companies a run for their money in a lot of different spaces. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Count on that for sure. And it poses an existential threat. And, you know, the, the, and the reason that these startups can be competitive is, is precisely because they can leverage data in a very asymmetric fashion. So, uh, so yeah, this will be fascinating to watch as well as the, the competition between the clouds and the data pipelining tools um, that each cloud um, is developing and embracing, whether it's the, the, the tools they make or the tools of their partners that they're supporting. Um, they're definitely in this golden age of um, data pipeline uh, and orchestration tools. And uh, it remains to be seen who, what, what platform is going to be the winner or if there ever will be a winner because everything just changes so quickly all the time. Yeah, I mean 
I, we, I think we'll see future emerging clouds as well. It'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see that maybe we will end up kind of with the standard oil situation where a handful of vendors completely control the market. But I think there's certainly the possibility that someone comes along and just does something completely different and then kind of flies under the radar until they pop out as this like huge competitor against the majors. So. Counting it, not even not even a bit money uh, against that idea. It's just because it's always happened. Uh, exactly. And yeah. when you start when you start uh, trying to count that out, um, you're you're inevitably on the losing side of a bet. So, um, yeah. Well, that good conversation. Um, we got a lot more uh, data pipeline related uh, data chats. Uh, I think coming out for the next several weeks. So, uh, this is the first of many. And um, yeah. On that note, happy happy Monday. So enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, happy November and uh, enjoy the winter. Yeah. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye.